Well, thank you very much. Just by way of introduction, this meeting really had a, its origins in an article written in Nature by James Wilsden and Robert Doubleday about two, three years ago, in which they posed the question of whether there was a need for an international conversation about the business of science advising to governments. And out of that, uh, I got a phone call from Stephen Wilson one day while I was walking down Fleet Street in London. As the minister points out, I'm never in New Zealand. Uh, uh, and Stephen said to me, I've been reading this article, might be a good idea to pursue it. What do you think? And out of that came the idea of establishing a working group, which the minister's already uh, named, and from there it's moved to this Congress that's here, and I thank all of those who have got here. I want to spend about the next 20 minutes or so giving my views on the general issues at a high level in the hope that it might start to frame a conversation which might evolve over the next 48 hours <coughs> so we can start to see what are the issues, the opportunities, the challenge across the broad breadth of providing a science advice into policy process to government and to see if there are some general issues, uh, general principles that might emerge from it. Because many of us have been engaged with the business of science advising to governments, but there's actually been surprisingly little discussion as to how this is best done, the principles underpinning it, on how we can learn from each other about what works and what doesn't, and do so within the context of different forms of society, different contexts, different ways to approaching public reason. And I think the way we set the agenda out was designed to try and allow that conversation to evolve over 48 hours. Right from the outset, it's important to realise that there are different forms of scientific advice, and they operate for different reasons than and in different contexts. I think it's a somewhat helpful heuristic to distinguish the use of science and evidence for policy making from that of developing policy advice to governments. But of course, it's only a heuristic because there's obviously a strong interdependency between these two domains of policy about which I'm sure we will hear more about in the next couple of days. But we need to also recognise that with respect to the business of po science advice for policy making, it's affected by both informal and formal inputs. And I'll say a bit more about the two of these. And there's again a big difference between formal inputs that are given on a regular basis or on a generalised basis, say by a national academy acting in a role of science advising to those of specific panels that are set up for specific purposes. And I think as we go through this meeting, we need to remember these distinctions between formal and informal roles, general and specific roles. By way of introduction, five years ago, I was appointed as the Prime Minister's first science advisor. I'm constitutionally independent, being neither a civil servant or a political staff appointment. Technically, I'm an advisory committee to the government, but an advisory committee of one person, while remaining academically salaried to ensure my, and my the principles of academic freedom underpin what I do. My major terms of reference are to promote the public understanding of science, to promote the use of science and evidence in public policy, to promote New Zealand's interest through science diplomacy, to provide scientific advice to the Prime Minister on issues as required, but to act only as a sounding board for, uh, for policy with regards, regards the science system itself, because that's obviously the responsibility of the Minister and his team uh, uh, as Minister of Science and Innovation. After the Second World War, the importance of science and national security had became very obvious, particularly in the United States, where I think we saw the start of science advice be really institutionalised into the business of government. First, to promote national security, and then more broadly to promote the growth, uh, the growth of the economic and industrial complex. And in effect, Vannevar Bush was the first presidential science advisor, and Sir Solly Zuckerman, who was a 
the first chief science advisor on poison in Britain exactly 50 years ago this day, both came to note because of their involvement in scientific efforts related to security and defence. And gradually a triple mode of science advice emerged in such countries. In formal and formal advice through the chief executive science advisor, and more formal and deliberate advice through national academies such as the Royal Society or through specific committees set up to address specific issues. Beyond that increasingly sophisticated, uh, uh, beyond that, policy ministries in the governments created increasingly sophisticated ways to reach out to science either by way of their own technical competencies or reaching out more and more to academies, experts, academia itself, and consultants. But until recently, recently, the nature of science advice at the centre of government was relatively comp compartmentalised. There was advice about the size and shape of government's investment in science, and there was technical advice generally on relatively linear issues regarding the use of science, say, in managing fish stocks or adopting new health technologies. In many ways, such examples are technological rather than scientific challenges, and with some caveats, they're not the source, the cause, of the challenges we face as practitioners and academics interested in this interface between science and policy. Rather, we face a very different set of challenges, and much of this has been influenced by the changing nature of both science and by, of government. Firstly, the nature of policy advice is now, and probably always was, much more fuzzy than standard textbooks on public policy make it out to be. The fuzzy policy reality is one that is critical to understand when considering how evidence informs policy. It's not an elegant cycle from problem identification to policy formation to decision making, to implementation and evaluation review and so forth, as the textbooks make it out to be. Policy makers and decision makers are not as distinct in their responsibilities as it's made out to be. And the policy analysts who populate much of this cycle are at every stage interacting consciously or otherwise with politicians, experts, lobby groups and the media. Of course, we all understand that science does not make policy and that the terminology, therefore, of evidence-based policy is somewhat naive. Rather, science informs policy formation and implementation. Science can do this at every stage of the process and it can be used to nudge the pro political process. Notably, it neither makes policy in itself nor singularly usually creates big policy shifts. And secondly, as, just as with policy formation, the nature of science has also changed dramatically. Science is no longer dominated by relatively linear questions. Computational developments, along with the growth of the research areas, research in areas such as biology, uh, environmental sciences, human sciences, have meant that science is now very much engaged in big systems questions. Of course, these big systems questions have some very specific characteristics. They're very non-complex, they're non-linear. There's always a large set of unknowns, and conclusions are generally reached in terms of probabilities rather than certainties. As a result, there's nearly always an inferential gap between what scientists think they know and what they conclude over such questions. And here we have a major problem. Governments expect and want certainty from science rather than conclusions being expressed with Popperian caveats and probabilities and that almost inevitable statement, more research is needed. Unavoidably though, the very big systems questions that science now engages with are precisely where the areas where governments need urgent help. Further, such issues inevitably have high values components, be they of belief and philosophy, as in the case of genetically modified foods or water fluoridization, or over economics, as in the case of climate change and energy security. In the end, the nature of all political processes as such 
the governments only can move so far from public opinion and their electoral contract. Scientists and advocates, for that matter, too often ignore issues of effect size, cost benefits, spillover and effects, positive and negative, and so forth. Indeed, because belief in ideology can often trump science in real world political processes, we have too often seen science become a proxy for political and ideological argument, even when science, at least at the level of the granularity that matters in policy terms, is effectively settled. Examples such as the reality of climate change or dealing with the obesity epidemic or the ethics of stem cell research come to mind. Trust in science is undermined when we allow science, just because it's complex, to be used as a proxy for what are ideological battles. And so we have a heady combination, complex and inevitably incomplete science, Issues of high public interest with strong values components and matters of high political urgency and discord, such as the world of post-normal science, where the facts are uncertain and values in dispute, the stakes high and the decisions urgent, but it's also now the domain of what I would call post-normal science advice. As I've earlier said earlier, it's important to distinguish from the outset between science for policy formation from, and that of developing policy for the science system, at least in terms of the discussion we're having. Clearly the same individuals are often involved in both, both, but they are usefully thought of a part in much of our discussions. All governments operate a science innovation system, and this must have a policy and management framework. Scientists obviously have a vested interest in how this framework operates, and most governments have an agency or ministry with scientists engaged in managing these systems. But it is difficult sometimes for the science community to understand that how government needs advice on developing these systems is not the same thing as meeting all the interests of the scientists as participants in the system itself. And sometimes that does lead to when the same individuals are involved in both advice on policy and policy around science, the science system, to accusations of conflict of interest and for the advice being seen as lobbying. And I think it's really important in this business of developing policy, uh, how science inputs into the policy process that we don't fall into the process of being accused of just being lobbyists for the science system. Our job, therefore, is to help maintain some conceptual and operational clarity. Policy advisor engagement and policy advice for the science system must be seen for what it is, namely helping governments to make best use of knowledge to advance their decision-making on the benefit of the country. There's a further issue which I think emerges because of the fact that science advisors are inevitably involved in the business of giving input on how science systems them themselves operate. And that is, science itself is undergoing the most disruptive change, in my view, that the science system has seen in the last 50 years. And because of that, the issues of policy around the science system itself are becoming more important for people such as myself. There are many factors contributing to this disruptive change, and I'll just list a few of the most obvious. F most glaringly important may be the democratization of science as it shifts from having a patronizing relationship with society to a true compact. As a result, there's a growing view by governments and society that the science system must be seen to have a more utilitarian relationship between it and the society. And this is most manifest in the move towards what you might call the impact agenda seen in most countries where governments are wanting to understand the impact of their investment in R&D. And I think the big challenge for us is to make sure that that doesn't just have a narrow economic focus and the broader role of impacts on the environment, 
public health, social conditions, and so forth, are kept in mind in that discussion. And of course, aligned with this is the growing recognition that many of the major societal issues that we confront have science and technology at their heart, particularly in terms of finding solutions. But at the same time, many people in pop the general public are understandably concerned by many new technologies, the pace of change, and the potential for unintended consequences. And of course, the very concepts of hazard, exposure, and risk are understood very differently by professionals to, though, to the general public. And so their understandings of what science and technology can do may be very different to those that we perceive. And then, of course, there's been a dramatic change in the nature of science communication, both reaching out to the public, which is fantastic, but also the changed nature of science communication within the profession of science. And thus we're seeing changes in the assessment of scientific performance arising with the changes arising with open access uh, publication and the changed means of, of science communication. And we all recognise that with the vast expansion of the scientific endeavour which has occurred in the last generation, the peer review system itself is close to collapsing under the pressure that's been created. Clearly, the ways peer review itself are conducted should be a matter of scientific inquiry. And the focus must be on finding and using systems that are transparent and ensure quality and integrity. Obviously, there's big changes in the way research is done with the move to open access data, the move to multidisciplinary teams, and these things are also changing, creating challenges for the way the science system has traditionally operated. And the greater transparency in science is starting to expose issues about the lack of professionalism in much of science, and in particular issues of research integrity. There's a growing concern over the issues of poor reproducibility of much science, perhaps driven by the nature of the science itself, but perhaps driven by the rush to publish, the academic impact agenda, and the personal egotistical states now accompany and now associated with so-called breakthrough science. A further issue we've got to address and think about is the changing nature of the relationship between the public sector and the private sector and R&D, as governments are now wanting to see closer relationships between those two groups. And there's one final co point I want to make in this context of discussing the change in the nature of science systems. Increasingly, we live in a post-trust society, and trust in the experts is increasingly hard to sustain. Scientists face this, as I've said, when science is used as a proxy of issues debate, and ideologues have found that one approach to driving their agenda is to undermine trust in science or scientists. On the other hand, as I've just mentioned, there are issues within the science community itself <coughs> that can undermine trust in the science system. And finally, we've seen the rise of the public scientists the scientists with a public face. This is obviously to be encouraged, but regrettably there have been scientists who've used their perceived position of trust to advocate for a cause often related to their science, but going well beyond the data, and in its extreme form, this can also undermine trust in the whole of science. Now, I could go on about this, but I think these are matters for a different conference. I think what I want to do in the last few minutes is focus on the primary issue for this meeting, namely how science and evidence can be best inserted into the highest levels of government decision making. As Sheila Jasanoff has pointed out, different countries have different traditions treating how, as to how public reason is formed, and this in turn is reflected in how systems of science advice have evolved. We've had countries with individual science advisors, countries that rely on panels, countries that rely on academies, country, and of course combinations of all three of those. I would argue that we need to get beyond a narrow focus on structure and, re and realize that inevitably we need a full mix of approaches. 
In particular, we need to consider the role of informal versus formal advice in the fuzzy world of policy processes I described earlier. For this audience, I do not have to expand on why governments need evidence to inform policy advice across every domain of government. The scientific process, defined broadly, remains the only means by which we have to develop relatively reliable information about the world and ourselves. The only alternatives to this are belief, tradition, dogma and anecdote. Although I must say the latter is probably the biggest influence on many politicians and voters. But having said that, it's now accepted by an increasing number of governments, and we have 47 countries represented here today, that evidence must inform what I call the post-normal policy process. The question is how to do this. Some scientists still think that science is about facts, and it's facts that make policy. But philosophical issues aside about what a fact is, the science that is generally needed is nearly always incomplete for the reasons I discussed earlier. I know that Heather Douglas is in the audience, and I'm greatly indebted to her work pointing out that the significant gap between what we can and what we can see in the scientific data and what we can conclude about what it might mean is a really important values-laden issue that a science advisory system needs to deal with. We as scientists must acknowledge the limits of what we know and yet still help the policy maker. In doing so, I would argue that it's critical that science advisory processes act as honest brokers, to use Roger Pilker's term, rather than advocates. Others may act as advocates, but the process of institutionalised informal and, inf and formal science advice needs to be based on honest brokerage of knowledge. And by knowledge, I don't mean just simply brokering facts. Knowledge is information and its context. What is known, what is not known, what is the power and limitations of the methodologies used. And honesty means indicating where values may have entered into the pop science process. The values domains are largely properly the domains of the policy maker and the politician. So let me turn now to the practical realities of science advising. Because I think this does bring us to the nub of one of the issues, and it's often ignored, namely the nature of institutionalised, informal and formal science advice. When the issues are very structured, generally for long-term matters or where there's little political contention or the matters are rather technical, Governments will and should establish panels or turn to academies for authoritative advice. The United States' use of, of the National Academies is a splendid example of doing that. In turn, whether a government does or does not may depend on the standing and confidence in the ability of the National Academy to act as a broker or as opposed to acting as an issues advocate. And that is an important issue because I think strong science advice being systems need strong national academies. Where such confidence is lacking or where the academy is not best structured to address an issue, governments may establish expert panels directly or through intermediaries such as myself. The more the issues relate to matters with greater values components, the more likely they are to turn to invited panels. This may or may not be appropriate, depending on what protocols sit around the use of such expert committees. The United Kingdom and the United States have both the established protocols for such activities, and it's part of my next year's work program to jointly develop and work with a network of departmental science advisors to develop such protocols here. But whatever kind of panel is established, or if the government turns to an academy, there are still obvious limitations. The report of a panel can inevitably, or an academy, can almost inevitably only insert itself at a single point into the policy process. Questions set the agenda, and the question has already been framed by the time the government turns to a panel. Such panels have no ability 
to play a role in the fuzzy post-normal policy processes I described earlier. As I've just me mentioned, some countries like New Zealand, Malaysia, UK and S Australia have established chief science advisor positions and these are increasingly being supported by networks of departmental science advisors. Such advisors have one unique and, in my view, critical function, namely that of informal input into the policy process. Obviously, they may have some for more formal input or manage formal input from others, but they have this unique capacity to be there at the beginning, wherever in that policy cycle the beginning is. They have the capacity to have an iterative engagement at every stage in the policy development, including the design of final policies. This is a critical role and should be seen, and it is important in my view, that it's seen to be independent of the usual political appointments that may occur alongside these things. It allows, the appointment of a science advisor allows for an honesty and frankness in dialogue not possible via a committee, particularly at the early stages of policy thinking. It allows a minister to explore ideas at the crucial early and most formative stage of policy development and to do so, to carry that discussion to be carried out in a safe policy space, minimising confusion and mixed public messages. I could go on about the role of the, this <coughs> informal advice, but in my view, such, is, such contributions are necessary in the reality of post-normal policy making and post-normal policy science advising. And of course, most acute of all of this is trusted advice and a trusted point of contact at the time of an emergency, as we'll discuss later on. But irrespective of whether advice is formal or informal, two characteristics are needed which in the end cannot be institutionally controlled. These depend on the public integrity of the individuals involved and the system in which they're embedded needs to be such that it ensures the independence of their advice. Formal advice is easier to quality assure as that advice is generally tangible and the processes are often public. But in the end, the issue of trust is much more difficult because the more values laid in the issue, the greater the accusations of bias, be it fair or unfair. Informal advice is more complex and hence the importance of individual integrity and quality and, ass and assurance that the individual concerned is independent. One key protection is to ensure that the role is in fact apolitical and is constitutionally independent, a feature which is not universal. Thus, in my view, trust is key. The advisor or the advisory system must have the trust of the policy maker and the politician to be effective and to be listened to, especially when there's a big gap between the science and prevailing ideology, as again we will discuss at this meeting. But equally, the science advisor needs the trust of the public and the media to the extent that that is possible. This creates some complex tensions. The tensions get even greater when one considers the expectations of the science community, which in my experience can be very naive when it comes to the understanding the science policy nexus. One of the ways I, they, they continue to confuse the role of the science advisor, whatever it is, with the role of being a lobbyist for the science system. One of the ways I've tried to engender tr trust in what I do is to write openly and talk openly about these issues and how science fits into the policy process. Another challenge is to choose when to enter the battles publicly. For it's human nature that for politicians to be more engaged and more open if they can assume that the discussion will not become a political lightning rod. No matter how independent a science advisor may constitutionally be, when that's doesn't matter whether it's an individual or an academy, it's catastrophic generally to battle governments in public. They become adverse to serious engagement. Yes, academies have more freedom than individuals in this regard, but they also have uh, uh, some constraints in how 
they can act if they wish to be effective. At this introduction, I've tried to open up a number of issues that I think we'll be spending the next two days discussing. We've designed this meeting so as to have a high-level engagement by practitioners of science advice of different types, along with input from academics who discuss, who study such issues. Hopefully we'll learn a lot from each other and find there's a lot more we should have and should discuss. Tomorrow afternoon we'll try to see whether that discussion leads to coming to some general principles and conclusions. But I suspect where we will end up saying is that the discussion is far from being complete. The fact that there are over 200 people here for the first such t discussion on this topic, the fact that there are 45 countries here, I think it's 47 as of this morning, means that there is clearly a lot more to say and we're only going to touch the tip of the, touch, the, touch some of the issues somewhat superficially. So I sense that at the end of tomorrow, we well, may well be discussing whether there's value in further discussion on this matter. I thank all of you for being here. I thank all of those of you who've come a long way in particular. I appreciate that New Zealand is not always the easiest place to get to. We think it's a rather short trip to just to fly 12 hours because we have to fly 12 hours to anywhere virtually. Um, but thank you for coming. Thank you for engaging in the discussion. I would hope that we can get through beyond just the superficiality of this is what I do, this is what you do, to actually get to some of the deeper issues that do deal with these issues of the extent to which the science system itself has changed and is changing, the extent to which the policy system is changing, and the fact that we're all here, 200 and odd people are here, suggests that there is an acknowledgement that with the big global and societal challenges we now face, science has a much more critical role in informing policy making at both the national, the sub-national, and the international level than it's ever had before. And with that, I thank you very much for coming, and I'll ask members on the first panel to join us.